Hello watch enthusiasts! Now to many the dial of a watch is the centrepiece of its design, and really defines the design of the entire watch and the quality of the product you're buying. And about a year ago I spoke about what I would view as the most beautiful dials on the market, and this year I'd like to produce a follow-up including only watches released this year. Because of course this is a very subjective point, but in this video I'd like to look at a few dials which offer a really wonderful demonstration of craftsmanship, both in terms of handmade dials and dials with an extremely high level of detailing, to, to also a dial with, uh, with a very interesting vintage inspiration, which has been extremely well executed. However, the, the resounding feature amongst all of these dials is they're very different to other options on the market, and offer something a little bit unexpected and uh, a real beauty in whatever form they take. Now the first piece I'd like to speak about is a piece which I reviewed relatively recently, and this is the Lorenzo DRZ02. And in the review I was quite clear about how impressed I was about the quality of the watch as a whole, but suffice to say that uh, I'm, I've been so impressed really by the design of the watch that I think it deserves a place in this video, and I think competes extremely favourably with much higher priced watches where dial designs are concerned. And of course the whole case of this watch was really very very beautiful, but as a result of the purpose of this video I will focus on the dial. But as a general explanation, the watch comes in a 316L stainless steel case, which is 50 meters water resistant, and is 41mm from side to side, by 48mm and by 11mm thick. Of course, this watch has had a very major automotive and uh, aviation influence, and this is seen in the case, which has this uh, lengthways brushing along it of a very, very fine graining. It also has dished sides with, uh, with brushing within those as well, and very deep but extremely finely polished bevels around the edge of the case. The bezel is very subtly domed upwards and floats above the rest of the case as well to give a little bit of, cl bit of clearance and a slight polished edge to, to really break up the form. The anti-reflective, slightly domed sapphire crystal also adds to this form because it meets that bezel almost perfectly to give a very smooth run over the edge of the bezel to the very centre of the crystal. And this means the watch can take on a, a very pure and a rather futuristic form, but with some nods to the past which are also appreciated. This is also seen in the crown, which has a very fine sort of finish, with these uh, these strakes down its surface, and of course a signed top. But the movement inside this watch is also um, a relatively high grade movement before the price, being a Salita SW200. However, it also features some modifications with a, a fully signed and decorated rotor weight for Dorenzo themselves, and of course the watch runs at 4 hertz and um, and has a 38 hour power reserve with a very reliable Swiss made architecture. But I feel the unifying factor with this watch is that wonderful dial. And the dial is an extremely complex piece but presented in a very simple formula. Because one sees a simple signing of Dorenzo and Automatic on it, with the logo at 6 o'clock, in addition to the placement of the date there, though you can have it without the date alternatively. But if you do choose it with the date, it has a circular date window, which has a matching date wheel to the colour of the dial, which is a very nice touch, and I think shows the attention to detail of the brand. At face value, the watch has four dial variants. There's a green, a blue, a, a, a light grey, in addition to the matte black, which, uh, which incidentally matches the, the PVD case that that version comes with. But all of them, apart from the matte black, have a sunburst effect to their surface, and also have a fumé style to the dial, with a more intense colour at the centre, fading out towards a black on the edges. However, that really is just the tip of the iceberg with these dials, because they also have features which uh, you wouldn't expect to see immediately, and take a bit of time to drink in. Now, each dial also has subtle variations, such as the colour of the Luminova, because of course these dials are very heavily loomed, with those two sides um, of the dial uh, illuminated, and of course the triangle at 12 o'clock in addition to those, uh, those dots at every quadrant. But this is, is actually cut out of the dial, and uh, this is noticeable when you look at the watch from the side, because this is a sandwich style of dial, so you have a plate with the Luminova underneath the dial pressed into place, which then fits onto the watch. And the coloration of the loom changes from model to model to match it better. So for instance, the light grey version comes with dark orange superluminova, the green old radium curled luminova, the blue a, a, a another tone of dark blue luminova, in addition to the black version having a simple C5 style of superluminova to give a very crisp white definition. To add to this detailing, the dial features a dished form, and so the whole dial is formed as a bowl with the edges and the, the fringes of the dial moving up towards the bezel. And this means there isn't really any sort of uh, rehort around the edge of the dial. And this means that you get a, a very, uh, very all-consuming form to the dial, and there really is no break between the case and the, the inner workings of the watch from your view of the piece. And this is a very interesting way of going about a dial, because usually domed dials move in the opposite direction. And so one has a, a unique form to this dial, which is also matched by the fact that the coloration of the dial itself is completely unique. 
And I say this because with the the sunburst effect versions, the coloration and the, uh, the the tone of the dial varies from edge to edge. And you'll notice, for example, on the blue version, there's a distinct copper undertone to the blue, which gives a wonderful colour to the dial and helps helps it become much more interesting upon inspection. And as the cherry on the top of this dial design, one has these beautiful style hands, which uh, which are, are bead plasters in their surface, but still have very crisp and very sharp edges with these luminous plots in their tips, and have a form which is reminiscent, although not quite the same as some FP Journe hands, to give a really wonderful design. And the price for this piece is 699 US dollars when it's released on the 12th of November, because previously it's uh, it's merely been available to press and as a pre-release model, but I can tell you really having handled the watch, it really is an incredible dial and, uh, and a remarkable piece at its price. Now the next piece I'd like to speak about is a new model from Longines which was originally hinted at and shown to some at Baselworld this year, but then re-released properly later on in the year. And this is the Longines Heritage Skin Diver, which I think has one of the best vintage style designs of, uh, of dials seen currently on the market. And this is a piece which comes in the form of a dive watch released in the 1950s by the brand, however it's grown to 42mm in this case, in a stainless steel case with these uh, elongated lugs, with brushed and polished finishes. And whilst the design of the case appears relatively limited in terms of its, um, its complexity, it's very much true to the original, which I must say I rather appreciate. And this extends even to the crown, which juts out slightly awkwardly from the case, and has cross-hatching on its top to mimic the, the super-compressor crowns of the period, which would, uh, would tighten under water pressure, making them rather an interesting alternative to a screw-down crown. Although today this crown has been replaced with a screw-down crown in order to give greater reliability for this 300-metre diver. You could say that the largest change to the original where the design is concerned is the bezel, which is no longer plastic, but now brushed stainless steel, which has a PVD finish to it. It's also fully graduated with these age styles of, of indices and numerals running around its edge, but still remains a, a very functional bezel, being unidire unidirectional and having these very large knurlings for grip on it. One also has a very heavily bubble-domed anti-reflective sapphire crystal, which gives this wonderful form to the, the front of the watch, and I think warms the dial somewhat. But the dial itself is an interesting piece, because it features this, this domed form which you would normally see on Tudors around this sort of price range, but I feel the care taken with this dial goes beyond that, because of its surface. Now the surface isn't just a sort of a, a, a matte black, but rather it's actually grained and textured to appear as though the dial has aged over the years, and though this doesn't appear too too bold, and so doesn't take on too, uh, too extreme a form of a, a style of tropical dial, it does still give texture and a great deal of, uh, of detail to the dial which otherwise simply wouldn't be present. The printing of the dial also appears rather beautifully done, with the individual numerals and indices giving slight depth to themselves through a very thick application of loom directly to the dial. It's also been aged to this, this coloured sort of brown, which appears much older, but also matches the, um, the, the writing on the dial with Longines and Automatic, which are also period correct. Interestingly, one also has a style of printing beneath those indices, which is slightly visible upon the, the, the fringes of the dial. And this shows the way that original dials used to be, be printed, with the loom over markings which were already painted onto the dial. And this creates a wonderful effect to the dial and gives it a great deal of charm and a very slight asymmetry and slight details which stand out, as opposed to having a completely uniform dial. Of course, the watch still retains symmetry thanks to the lack of a date, but I think this just complements the design slightly more and really helps with the form. The hands are also rather lovely additions to the dial, being rhodium plated and then polished, with also elements such as the tapered second hand, which is slightly shorter than you would normally expect, in addition to that, um, that style of, uh, of spade hour hand and sword style of minute hand, which are all slightly shorter than you would expect, help to emphasise the curvature of the dial and really help it stand out on the front of this watch. Aside from the rather wonderful design of this watch, beating inside it behind that wonderfully embossed case back with a diver on it, one has the calibre L888.2, and this is a 21 joule ETA based movement which has been designed um, and is used exclusively by Longines, which runs at 25,200 vibrations per hour. And so it hasn't been dropped entirely to the 6 ticks a second of a lot of the, the longer power reserve ETA based movements, but rather sits somewhere in the middle with 7 ticks a second, which is equivalent to what Omega use. However, it extends the power reserve from about 40 hours to uh, 64 hours, which is a helpful addition and means you can leave the watch for, uh, for longer periods of time off the wrist without it running down, really adding to the, the convenience of this 300 meter dive watch. And so this watch in terms of price is competing very closely with models from Tudor, for example, at £1,910. However, I feel this is a very favourable comparison because the design of this watch and the details are very much on par and of course it has that beautiful dial. The third watch in this video is a somewhat unlikely release by Panerai, which took place over a month ago. 
And this piece is the Panerai Radio Mir 1940 Three Days a Chao, because it's the steel version. However, this is the version which comes in the form of the PAM 00790 and the PAM 00791. And these are versions which are, which are designed to pay uh, homage to Tapanarai's influence from Florence as a result of the establishment of their brand there in 1860. Now, before I address the elephant in the room, which is of course that dial and handset, which is very uncharacteristic for Panerai, the watch itself takes on the standard 1940 Radiomir style case, and so comes in polished stainless steel with this cushion form to the case in a 47mm size. However, as a change to the standard Radiomir, it no longer features wire lugs, which, whilst very beautiful, um, are not the most resilient in the world, and also are very difficult to change straps on. So uh, instead it has these fixed lugs which, uh, which allow you to have a much more conventional strap changing experience. It also has a much more modern crown which sits, sits closer and flush to the case instead of the protruding style of, uh, of onion crown on the conventional uh, version. As a result of these features it does make a, a very convincing style of aquatic watch because it's water resistant to 100 meters and of course thanks to that uh, robust case and that thick bezel it is very resilient. It also has a, a sapphire case back so you can see into the movement which, uh, which allows you to see the, the caliber uh, P3000 from Panerai, which is one of their in-house movements. And it has a few interesting features other than being manually wound and very beautifully decorated, because it has an independent hour hand, and so you can move that incrementally, um, instead of having to change the time entirely if you're changing time zone. The watch also has a three-day power reserve, so 72 hours, which gives you a great deal of time to be able to wait between winds, and whilst not quite the eight days of some of their movements, I think it's still perfectly adequate for the vast majority of people, and still more than you would normally expect. But the real changes to this watch come with the dial, and of course to the, uh, the front of the watch in general. Because the idea of this watch was to, to pay homage to, uh, to the, the pendulum clocks produced by Panerai in Florence, um, before really before producing these military watches and becoming known for them. And so on the front it has a plexiglass crystal where a conventional Panerai would have a sapphire crystal, which gives a warmer tone to the dial as a result of the reflectivity of it and the refractive index of this, this particular material instead of the, the cold and rather crisp style of, of light which comes through sapphire. The dial also is completely new, because gone is the black style of sandwich or sausage dial that one normally gets on Panerai's, and instead one gets this wonderful style of, of rather more old-fashioned dial. Of course, there's a very strong Art Deco influence to the dial, with those numerals curling over, such as the 12, and of course the 2 and, uh, and 3 around the edge of the dial. These come in, in two colours, really, in black or in cream, but both feature a central ring around the inside of the dial, around the Radiomir Panerai signature, then with the numerals in between, and then on the far edge one has these um, this style of railway track for the minutes. Of course, the dial comes in two versions, with the, the cream colour and the black version. Now the black version is the more conservative in many ways, with a matte black base which has a slight uh, slight sort of um, tone to it, so it's not quite a cold black, but more of a warm tone to it, which I suppose is helped by the fact that it has these golden hands, in addition to golden elements on the dial where the numerals, and also where the individual markings on the dial are concerned. However, the version I find more interesting is the cream dial, because it's sort of an ivory colour, and so one gets this, uh, this off-white tone to it which is very warm and matches the strap beautifully. To complement that, one also has a darker beige which fills out the indices around that, uh, that minute track, as well as around that ring on the centre of the dial. And to complement that further, one has this, this, uh, this blackened colour to the hands which still is reflective and acts as more of a gunmetal colour to each of the lines and uh, demarcations on the dial in addition to the numerals. Of course, whilst mentioning the hands, one really should note they themselves are also an interesting shape, with a cap over the centre of the hand stack in addition to a bevel down their centre, and of course a polished form with these sword shapes, although with a slight notch cut into the hour hand, to add a certain amount of character and refine them somewhat. Now these pieces are being produced in 300 pieces each, being priced at 8,900 euros, which is admittedly no small amount of money, but uh, nonetheless I felt they deserved a place on this list, because their dials are just such a beautiful form, and are, in terms of their design, extremely clean, very clear, and also very beautiful. The penultimate piece I'd like to speak about today is a really beautiful model from Laurent Ferrier. And this piece was released earlier this year at SIHH. And of course Laurent Ferrier are by no means the, the largest brand in the world, but put out a number of very, very beautiful dress watches. And this piece is my favourite amongst all of the models they make, because it has such symmetry, such balance, and, and such careful design to it. And the piece itself is the Gallier Annual Cal de Montrigol. And this forms a rather beautiful version of, uh, of what one would normally expect from their designs, with this very curved form, 
And admittedly in this size, it's a very conservative form and size for a dress watch, but I think it incorporates the complication of an annual calendar extremely well, with a very seamless design and true symmetry to the dial. The case itself is a rather attractive balance of traditional forms, with some modern touches and some elements which make it slightly heavier, and give it a slightly greater emphasis in terms of its shape and its, its form, as opposed to a more conservative style of case. For a start, it has a very emphasised bezel, which allows the whole case to take on a very rounded form, in addition to a beautiful pumpkin crown, and the, uh, the small switch, of course, on the one side of the case, to operate the, uh, the change of, um, of, of the calendar. One then also has these enlarged and reinforced lugs, which give a rather attractive shape to the case, in addition to the fact that the case comes in three versions, a stainless steel version, and then 18 karat gold you can get yellow gold or pink gold. Now, my personal favourite must be the stainless steel version, because I feel it has a design which is uh, much more clean and much more simple than the gold variants, though of course all of them have their particular charm. Before speaking about the dial, I feel talking about the movement which powers this dial would be an interesting place to start. And the reason for this is because the movement itself is a real masterpiece in terms of design and beauty, and Loire Ferrier movements are invariably very, very beautiful devices. Now, this particular movement, which happens to be the, uh, the calibre LF126.01, is a movement which is manually wound, and I think all the better for it, because you get a fantastic view of the inner workings, as a result of not having an automatic winding section on top of it. Now, one sees several plates and bridges with these individual cocks for the escapement, um, or rather the escape wheel, you should say, and of course the balance wheel. On the back, you also see beautiful Geneva striping, or Coudre de Genève, along the, uh, the bridges themselves, and then perlage behind them and underneath the, uh, the, the balance, which is a wonderful thing to see, and I think adds great depth to the movement. Then, an interesting detail is that one also sees a power reserve indicator placed on the one side of the movement, which is nice to see on the back of the watch, because of course if you're winding the watch it will be off the wrist, so you can check to see how wound the watch is whilst you're actually doing the winding and not have to bother with it otherwise. Other details of this movement are that it runs at uh, 3 hertz, has an 80 hour power reserve which is very helpful for a manually wound watch, and also has a, um, uh, a screwed balance, and so you, you adjust the, the, uh, the attachment or the, the position of these screws to change the inertia of the actual balance wheel itself, rather than changing the length of the spring, which means you get a more stable timekeeping once it's set. Now, of course, the, this movement does have also an exquisite level of detailing, with these uh, beautiful polished bevels around the edge of the movement, and of course also the coloration with Laurent Ferrier and the signing on it really does add weight to this design. But the beauty of this movement is that it provides a very clean and very symmetrical display on the dial, which manifests itself immediately through the way in which the calendar is presented. In many ways, the dial of this watch is very traditional in its presentation of the time, because one has the simple setup of having small seconds at 6 o'clock on a separate subsidiary dial, in addition to having these two larger central hands, which are these, um, these styles of lance shape, with that, um, that, that hour hand reaching only to the very edge of the central, uh, central section of the, the dial, and of course with the minute hand reaching all the way to the very edge of the minute markings. But the fact that this dial is made with, with such care is what's interesting. Now if I take the centre of the dial for a start, that central section of the dial is vertically brushed on both the slate version and the silver version. On that one has the, the, uh, the day of the week and the month cut out, in addition to having a, a central hand which points to the date around the very edge of the dial. One also has in the centre of the, the, uh, the, the dial this quadrant style of crosshair form, which just adds balance and symmetry to the dial altogether. Around the edge of this central section to the dial, the details start to emerge, with a ring of circular brushing which features the in individual indices for the minutes, and of course a double strake at 12 um, to mark the 12 o'clock point, in addition to thicker ones at uh, 3 and 9. Around this ring one also has the small seconds which perfectly cuts it um, between the, the central section of the dial and this brushed element, which itself has a concentric ring cut into it, which is then uh, further detailed around the very edge of it in a different finish again. And then as though to add even more to this dial, one has the ring around the very edge of the dial, which features the days of the, uh, the month, which are marked in blue and red depending upon the, the day, with of course a red hand reaching to them in a similar style. And I feel the whole concept of this builds an extremely complicated, but extremely simple in its most basic form dial. And so together I feel this makes a real harmony in terms of aesthetic, but also a real beauty in terms of understanding the craftsmanship that's gone into this piece. And so with all these details, it's really undeniable that this piece deserves a place on this list, just for its sheer beauty of skill where it comes to, to making this dial and designing it to match with the rest of the watch. The final watch I'd like to speak about is a very interesting piece from Credor. 
And Credor is a brand which is uh, owned by Seiko and operates as a very small scale high end production and um, version of Seiko, producing their own range of watches but using Seiko's technology. And this model is the HE2 10th anniversary of Spring Drive for Credor. And it's a model which has been re released um, following the, the platinum version of this watch being released a few years ago as a, a form of, of celebration, really, of this brand reusing the Spring Drive technology at a more luxurious level than Grand Seiko conventionally does. And this is a watch which takes a very simple dress form, and again takes a, a very simple and very traditional size as well, which is 39mm in, uh, in diameter by 10.3mm thick. However, with this watch it really is the details above all other things which define this piece as a thing of real beauty. And so with this piece one sees the highest quality of every component going into a model, which itself is quite simple. And so this watch does only display the time with the hours, the minutes and the seconds, but it does so with an incredible level of style and an incredible level of quality. But starting with the case, the, the case is fully polished and is of course in this case in rose gold. The case itself though has been polished with a, uh, with a Zeratsu style of finishing, which has been finished to an even higher standard than one would normally accept from Seiko. And bearing in mind that Seiko are known for their, the quality of their cases and the quality of their finishing, this really is an incredible feat. One has a level of polishing which is incredibly high, and so one gets a very rich glossiness to the surface which you wouldn't get from other brands. And of course this is no inexpensive watch at 42,000 US dollars, but I feel bearing in mind the fact that only 20 of these can be made each year, the price is very much justified. The movement of this watch is a similar story of understated technology taken to an incredibly high standard. And this is the Caliber 7R14. And the movement itself is a manually wound movement which runs Seiko's spring drive technology. However, the detailing on this movement is beyond obsessive. One sees bridges which have this, uh, this wide and, and beautifully balanced and extremely uh, deep style of brushing across their surface, in addition to 41 jewels placed very carefully and very artfully around the surface of the bridge. One also has thermally blued screws of an extremely high standard, and of course on the one side of the movement a power reserve indicator to give you an idea of how the, um, the power is being discharged, which is particularly important bearing in mind the way this movement operates, but more on that in a minute. One also has beautiful cutouts to the bridges to show different wheels, such as the famous glide wheel to this spring drive technology. And of course one also has a skeletonized floral pattern to the spring barrel which just adds further detail to this piece, in addition to the perfectly handmade and hand done bridges, which feature this um, very, very high level of polishing on their bevels and curvature on these, which simply wouldn't be possible with a machine. Technologically, the watch carries its, uh, its name H extremely well, which means wisdom. And this is down to the use of spring drive in the movement. And so what this means is that it removes the need for a conventional escapement and balance wheel. And instead you have a conventional spring running through a, a gear train. But where you would normally have an escapement, you now have something called a glide wheel. And what this is is a wheel which turns uh, with the movement and uh, unwinding of the spring. But instead of using an escapement to regulate the amount of, uh, of energy that goes into the, um, the, the second hand and the movement of the hands in a given time, it instead uses a quartz oscillator. And this uh, in turn regulates a brake which slows that glide wheel and slows the, um, the movement down to its correct speed. And what this means then is that you're able to have a completely smooth run to the second hand with no ticking whatsoever. And this gives an incredible look to the front of the watch but also gives remarkable accuracy. Because where a normal watch would uh, would struggle to exceed uh, plus or minus two seconds a day, this can keep to at uh, plus or minus fifteen seconds a month, which is a significant improvement on timekeeping and allows it to uh, to really be a, a remarkable piece of technology incorporated into a very conventional style of design. It's also able to have a longer power reserve than would otherwise be possible with this technology, thanks to the use of a torque recovery system, which, which as the name would suggest, recovers um, the energy uh, spent by the movement to move the hands in such a way as to extend the power reserve. This is of course also seen through the power reserve indicator on the case back, which shows the 60-hour the power reserve this watch has. Now whilst speaking about the, uh, the, the watch itself and its design, the dial is of course the centrepiece in this video. And the dial at first appears very simple, with a very sem simple style of, uh, of 5 minute graduation on the dial, in addition to two, uh, two strakes at 12, and simple cred or logo. However, this is far from the truth because the hands are thermally blued, and of course the whole watch is entirely handmade, so one has a, a quite remarkable piece of, of engineering going into it to start off with. However, the dial itself takes a very different form to what you would immediately expect. 
because it's not an, ala- an enamel dial, but rather a porcelain dial, meaning there's no metal substrate in the conventional sense that you would normally have with an enamel dial. It also means you get this incredible pure white, which you wouldn't get otherwise, and which creates a, a, quite, a quite, quite spellbinding look to the front of the watch. But the most incredible element about this is the fact that each of those lines, and even the Credor logo, are hand-painted. Now this is an incredibly time-consuming process, and you can imagine just how steady the hand of the painter has to be to put in these lines and, and details by hand with a paintbrush. Now to put that into context, these slightly blued lines which are painted onto the surface of this dial without any sort of mechanical aid by hand are really miles apart from what other brands produce, especially in this price range. But even even if you look at the dial produced for a million plus pound Patek Philippe, you'll notice that these dials are printed, not hand painted. And so it does just show the amount of care going into these pieces, and really explains the reason why so few are produced each year. But what's most incredible is that in terms of price, this piece is competing almost perfectly with the sort of price range you would pay for a um, high-end Rolex day date. And so, by contrast, this is a really incredible piece, with craftsmanship which stands head and shoulders, at least in my eyes, above products from Rolex, for instance, at that sort of price range. And so, with a dial this pure and this beautifully manufactured, I think it certainly deserves a place in this video, with such craftsmanship and such elegance. And so I'll conclude the video here, but do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of this video, and also what you thought of my choices, because I realise it's a very personal choice, but I'm curious what you think. And so thank you very much for watching, if you did enjoy the video then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and also to be able to see more videos and content here in the future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Armour the Watch Guy, out.